All right, good morning, everybody. My name is Representative Rosemary Rung, and I'm the chair of the HB 737 Commission. And this is a meeting of our monthly meeting, uh, although we have not met since October due to the election and, and just transitions of that. So I'd like to welcome you. Um, if you could refer to the agenda, um, our first item of business is to accept the minutes of October 14th. Um, I do want to note that there were several changes that were brought to me by Mr. Preventer, who has actually has agreed to take the minutes of today's meeting. Um, so I'm sorry I wasn't able to send you that marked up copy, um, but um, I'll allow Mr. Preventer if you want to go over those. But first, could we have a motion to bring these minutes to the floor? Okay, moved by Representative Dunn is, and seconded by Dr. Woods. Are there any corrections or changes to the minutes? Mr. Preventer, do you want me to just go and summarize the changes you submitted? Yeah, I'm trying to uh, find the file here. Okay. <laughs> um, on the first page, um, under uh, NHDES update, oh, yeah. um, Mr. Preventer kindly uh, added in the nanograms uh, after there was a, um, uh, it says St. Cobain reported that the first event resulted in 5.19 e to the seventh power, which is 0 0.00000519 pounds. Um, I believe, Mr. Beventure, you also are expressing that in uh, nanograms, but it would be nanograms per kilogram or nan. I think I, think I asked uh, Mr. Wimsat, and he already had the number prepared and I think he said it was 225,000 nanograms and I think that's just mass we're talking about there so oh, I don't okay. think okay so just nanograms okay right so I figured that would kind of put it in more context cuz people are used to measuring or looking at PFAS in terms of nanograms um so I just I just put that clarification in there I was recommending the uh, IE 225,000 nanograms to add okay. to that if there's, right. there's no uh, objection okay um and then the next <clears throat> excuse me the next addition was um in the next paragraph it says uh saint cobain has not you're adding the word not completed the rainwater study required in the consent degree i had omitted not so yeah i wasn't sure <laughs> if if i was remembering the prior meeting where they hadn't done the rainwater study at that time um, or if if some level of rainwater study had been done. Um, well, that, if I may. Yeah, but sure. go ahead, Mr. Yeah, that, that, that was true at the October meeting as well. The, uh, the At that time, the rainwater study had not been done. I have some news on that today, but we'll save that for later. Okay, so Mr. Wimsat, would it be um, accurate to include the word not in there? Yeah, I, I'm not sure why that wasn't in there. Okay, and then, um, the, the next paragraph, uh, it just said N NHDES received a work plan for the installation of POET. <clears throat> I don't know why that wasn't there. I mean, some of this may have been my problem when I cut and pasted. Um, and then a stipulation and a letter. The third line um, is added uh, when it says uh, uh, NHDES reviewed and approved the work plan with stipulations in a letter so we actually have the dated letter of October, august 22nd <clears throat> and then um revised work plan on the next line um and then a letter dated october 5th 2022 that would be the end of that the following sentence so if i can read the new paragraph it says on june 29th nhdes received a work plan for the installation of POET systems at the properties identified in the June 23rd agreement. NHDES reviewed and approved the work plan with stipulations in a letter dated August 22, 2022. NHDES met with St. Cobain on September 13th to discuss the NHDES comments and received a revised work plan on September 26, 2022. NHDES reviewed and approved the work plan with stipulations in a letter dated October 5th, 2022. So that would be the new the new paragraph. <clears throat> and then uh, three other changes <clears throat> on page two in the first sentence. 
it will it's proposed to now read on July 12th, NHDES received, a, and this is the addition, remedial action implementation report that documented the provision of alternate water for each property described in the 2018 consent decree. And the next change proposed is further down on that page, the fourth paragraph from the bottom. It will say, St. Cobain, um, presented a, and this is the addition, work plan for residential well sampling and 15 addenda to the sampling plan relative to the 2019 AGQS on June 3rd, 2022. And then the final uh, proposed correction is on page three. It's the middle of the page, the paragraph that begins with Mr. Preventure. The it would now read, Mr. Preventure asked about the PFOA in Mr. Wimsat's report and if St. Cobain is still using it, and this is the addition, as a, raw, as a raw product or if PFOA is being created by transformation from other PFAS being used. So sorry I didn't have all of these in the draft that I sent you, um, but um, are there any other additions or corrections to the minutes of October 14th? No. No questions? Okay. Um, all those in favor of uh, accepting the minutes, uh, please raise your hand. Okay. And Dr. Bush? Yes. Okay. Thank you. The minutes The minutes are approved as edited. Um, now, if, if we can go on to the October 21st minutes. Um, those are pretty short. That was just the meeting where we took the vote on the annual annual summary. Um, so I'll entertain a motion to accept those minutes as submitted. Moved by Representative Mercy, Murphy, seconded by Ms. Allen. Are there any additions or corrections to those minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the minutes as submitted, please raise your hand. Okay. Um, any uh, Dr. Bush? I vote yes. Okay, minutes are approved as submitted. Thank you very much. Um, now we'll move on to item number three, DES update. <clears throat> Mr. Wims, at the floor is yours. <clears throat> Thank you and good morning, everybody. Um, and first of all, uh, congratulations to all the uh, legislators on the uh, commission that were reelected. Um, so our update this week is, uh, or, or this month, is uh, as follows. We start with the Air Division. Um, with respect to permitting activities, um, sorry about that. Uh, with respect to permitting activities, uh, on November 22nd, St. Cobain, through their consultant bar engineering, submitted an updated air deposition modeling analysis. Uh, and there'll be a link to that in my in my notes um, that was associated with the results of the 2022 stack test that occurred earlier um, at the end of the summer, early fall. Um, DES is currently reviewing permit applications um, 210198 and 220092. Uh, the expectation, the, the way that that works is if if DES recommends issuance of a permit, they would draft, they would cook, uh, prepare a draft permit which would then be uh, shared with the source for comment and then would go out to public comment and a hearing if requested. And we expect that if that happens, it would happen sometime in late in quarter one. So sometime in February or March of, of 2023. Um, there's no update with regard to inspection activities. Um, regarding the stack testing, the stack testing took place on August 24th and 25th of this year. Uh, DES had two experienced staff members present to observe the method in which the samples were collected and the operation of the towers at the facility during the stack test. Uh, the RTO did not encounter any issues and the stack test was completed as designed. DES received the stack test report on October 24th and is in the process of reviewing that report. Uh, with respect to bypass operations on October 31st, DES sent a letter to St. Gobain clarifying the requirements with the permit deviation reporting. And since the last update to the commission in October, St. Cobain has submitted the following, uh, three uh, permit deviation reports uh, dated September 16th, October 6th, and November 7th. And there are links to those documents uh, in, in my notes. 
Uh, moving to the waste management divisions update. <clears throat> so activity includes that on June, and, and this is a little bit of review, but it gives some context for, for the updates. On June 29th, the ES received a work plan for the installation of POET systems at the properties identified in the June 23rd agreement. Uh, DES reviewed and approved the work plan with stipulations in a letter dated August 22nd. And again, there are links to these documents in the notes. Uh, DES met with St. Cobain on September 13th to discuss uh, the DES comments and received a revised work plan on September 26th. Uh, we reviewed and approved that work plan with stipulations in a letter dated October 5th. Um, so in late November, St. Cobain finalized the contract with the water filtration system installation contractor, that's Second Wind Water Systems, Inc., and uh, currently is currently working on a contract with the second POET contractor. Uh, the first batch of letters uh, to, to, to residents to identify to them that they've been selected for a POET and that they would be, you know, basically sent out by the, by the, uh, by the company, um, were mailed out to 229 property owners in Bedford and Merrimack on November 29th. And those letters notified them of the filtration system contractor and requested uh, that the owner set up a pre-installation inspection appointment. So the pre-installation inspections are now underway and installations will, the actual installations will likely start in January of, of, of the new year. And their contractor has indicated, uh, both contractors, both the ones they uh, already have a contract with and the one they're negotiating with, uh, have indicated they believe all the poets can be installed in less than one year. So we would expect that that would all happen within 2023. Um, on July 12th, DES received a remedial action implementation report that documented the provision of alternate water for each property described in the 2018 consent decree. And we're in the process of reviewing that report and we'll provide comment as needed. Uh, St. Cobain is proceeding with design work for water line installations for the towns of Litchfield, Bedford, and Merrimack. These include areas with um, primarily with existing water lines where homes require connections to the water mains in the street, uh, but also include some areas where new short water main installations will, will be made. Um, St. Cobain is working with a water provider and currently evaluating the feasibility of the water line extensions for the town of Londonderry. Um, we understand that that contract has been let with Penishuk. They'll be, they're going to take about 12 or 13 weeks to complete over the winter, essentially, uh, their review and, and, and essentially a conceptual, you know, design and evaluation for that. Um, they anticipate that that will be, that conceptual design will be completed in the spring and then uh, would, would move towards, uh, you know, based on that and making sure that all things are approved, um, they would work. To, to do a final design following that. Um, on August 17th, DES met with St. Gobain to discuss the requested application for a groundwater management permit and a groundwater management zone. It was determined that the company would not be able to submit the application for the groundwater management permit by the date, by the due date of August 26th. Uh, DES met with them and DOJ and attorneys for St. Gobain on October 4th and then the purpose of that meeting was to discuss sampling and the application for the groundwater management permit. And those discussions uh, regarding that application and establishment of the groundwater management zone are, are ongoing. Uh, following the transition of uh, areas in Londonderry to the new bottled water contractor, we're finding the outer water calls are essentially been eliminated, uh, which is great news. St. Cobain continues to transfer more homes over to the new bottled water delivery contractor based on geographic area. And uh, there are currently 300, about 340 properties that have been, uh, I lost my place here, <laughs> uh, about 340 properties that have been transferred over to the new bottled water contractor, all within the town of Londonderry. And additional homes in Londonderry may be transferred in early 2023. Um, we're going to continue to monitor the situation, but it does seem to be improving considerably. Uh, on November 16th, uh, DES and DOJ completed its review of the November 4th proposal from St. Cobain to remedy additional water supply wells within the consent decree area. This agreement provides water line connections or POETs to 44 additional properties within the area of impacts. Uh, remedies included in the new agreement include the following. So in the Bedford, 
point of entry treatment systems for 21 properties and water line connections for two properties. In the Hudson, in Hudson, the point of entry treatment systems for four properties. In Litchfield, point of entry treatment for three properties and water line connections for four properties. And then in uh, Londonderry, point of entry treatment systems for eight properties. And in Merrimack, connections for two properties. So at, at this point, we what's happening is for all the homes where there's been an identified exceedance or properties where there's been an identified exceedance and we've indicated that St. Gobain is responsible for providing an alternate water remedy, they have proposed either a water line connection or a poet. So, we, so and, and as they, as you know, they're continuing to do sampling. So as they do that sampling, the expectation is that they will, you know, when they, when they determine that there are additional homes that they're responsible for, properties they're responsible for that are above the standard, they will then propose either a poet or a water line remedy for each of those properties. So they will keep progressing as time goes on. Um, so at this point, all the ones that, that we've identified that they're responsible for, they have proposed a remedy, either a poet or a water line. And really, I think the only place where that's still a little bit in play in terms of confirming it and nailing it down is this the significant work they're doing in London Dairy to develop a conceptual design. Obviously, you know, it's one thing to say, yeah, we want to do a water line here, or we want to do a poet here. But then if it's a water line, you've got to look at what it takes to actually get that water line in there. And so that's really what that conceptual design is about. So we'll, we'll have a, a firmer view of what's going to happen in London Dairy once that conceptual design is completed in the spring. So moving on to the water supply sampling. Um, St. Gobain presented a work plan for residential well sampling in 16 addenda. The 16th addendum uh, was submitted uh, on December 8th, um, or excuse me, it was, it was submitted uh, on November 30th, and we reviewed and approved that addendum on December 8th, so that was yesterday. Um, so uh, as of uh, November 30th, so this, these numbers are updated as of, um, again, the addendum 15, they don't include the numbers in the addendum 16 because that was just approved yesterday but basically as of the 15th addendum and as of november 30th in terms of results we've received um, there are three three thousand eight hundred and two properties that have been identified for sampling three thousand seven hundred and ninety access agreements have been sent and they're running that's 108 more than the june report and we're running about a 69 percent return rate on that um, there's 2,375 samples have been collected from water supply wells. That's 10 more than the October report. And then 1,023 properties have been offered bottled water, and that's 11 more than the October report. Now, with regard to site investigation, St. Gobain's consultant conducted post uh, uh, you know, treatment stormwater uh, stormwater sampling in, you know, in this period after the installation and operation of the RTO on November 11th, and we've been waiting for that for a long time. You may recall that we've been talking about that. I've been providing updates for the last you know, many months. Uh, and unfortunately, the summer between low rain and then the rain we did get tended to come in violent, quick storms. It just didn't present itself with a good opportunity to do effective stormwater sampling. We finally got that, and uh, that was completed on November 11th. So we would expect that uh, within about six weeks, uh, they would get, um, We'll get a report on the on the results of that of that stormwater sampling, and then um, that that's an important date because the remedial action plan that's due to New Hampshire DES is due 120 days after Saint Gobain's consultant receives the analytical results from the stormwater sampling. So that should be you know that trigger date should be coming up over the next you know uh, next few weeks. Um, so that we think that that would mean that the wrap will probably be. Uh, do uh, sometime around the end of March. That's that's what we anticipate based on uh, on those dates. And then um, last of all, uh, at the last meeting, the chair had requested that DES work on a proposal for, you know, kind of a graphical representation of the progress that's being made on implementing alternate water remedies, which I think is a terrific idea. And Andy Fuller, our project manager, has been working on this. And what I'd like to do is um, is uh, share my screen just to very briefly show you um, a uh, four slides that 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 are really essentially a proposed view of what this would look like. 
So I'm going to share my screen and see if that works. Um, let me know if you can see that. And see your screen. Okay, great. And let me just put that in slideshow format. So um, this is really just a, a and this is just a subject to your comments and your thoughts. It's a first crack at, at trying to represent graphically what I think the chair was asking for when we last discussed this. So essentially, it's a remedy tracking slide. You know, it's it's so if we look project wide. This goes for all the basically the, the the wells that were identified in this recent agreement in the spring, and um, how they're proposed to be provided with alternate water. We um, break it down here by town, and the, the chart at the right shows the town and the proposed water line connections, um, and basically you know how many of those have been completed, how many are remaining, and. Are, oh, I see what you're seeing. You're probably not seeing this the right way. Let me try to show that to you. No, that didn't work very well. Mike, go up to the top where your display settings are and switch it to presenter mode. Uh, you, okay, yeah, I've got to get out of the problem is I'm in, I see what's happened. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's been a while since I've done this. And, so I'm sorry, Amy, what what do you want? What so do you want me to do? Go back into PowerPoint like you had it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm I, I'm not sharing my screen anymore, am I? No, you are. You are. We yeah. can see your desktop with all of your uh Oh gosh, that's not yeah. <laughs> <laughs> busted. <laughs> can you see that now? No, we see the screen where it has your like joint uh okay. You can't now. You unshared. Okay. Well, I'm not sure why. It, yeah, I think it's. I think this was supposed to be easy. <laughs> so, so what do you see now? We see the same screen, but go ahead into PowerPoint, and I'll show you what to do. Well, when you say go into PowerPoint, I mean, my other screen has PowerPoint. I don't know. Okay, go into switch it so you're in presenter mode. So you're presenting like full screen. Okay, now on the screen where you can see the slide you're, that you're presenting, and then you can see your next slide at the top, you'll see yeah. display settings. Oh, okay. Thank you. And if you switch that to um, just swap them. Yep. There you go. You're good. That working? Okay. <laughs> Great. All right. So, so anyways, this is showing the uh, the progress that's been made with respect to waterline uh, connections. Did that, did that pop out? That looks different for me. Are you still seeing the slide? Yeah, we see it well. I see it well. Okay. All right. Um, so then uh, if we go to the next, so that's talking about the progress on waterline connections specifically. The second slide here is showing the progress on poets. Um, and as you can see, the, the table shows the actual raw numbers and then the bar graphs at the left show the progress. So obviously we're not, we don't have a lot of progress right now. We're just getting those letters mailed out. So um, as, as the months go on, these we, we would see the advanced progress of, of getting these poets installed. And then the third slide or the fourth slide is really just a how we would, would show for each municipality the percent completion of the particular um, uh, in remedy, whether it's a poet or a water line. So we would prepare for all five of the towns, we prepare an individual slide for each town that would show the progress. So this shows that 37% of the poet installations that are slated for Bedford have been completed and 62.5% of the waterline connections. But we would have a separate slide for each municipality showing that. So that, that's it. I um, really just wanted to show you what we're thinking. And, and we think that's something that, you know, as we get reports from Golder, uh, um, uh, St. Gobain's uh, consultant, they could actually even populate this in real. So, so basically, as soon as that work was done, they can provide us with updates so that at each of our monthly meetings, 
we could provide you with an update like this. I would make it part of my regular update and I would include these slides to, to give you a thumbnail sketch of how things were going with Remini implementation. And I'm happy to take any comments or questions about that. And if you want to look at a particular slide, just let me know and I'll switch to it. Mr. Wimsett, thank you very much. This is exactly what I was looking for. Um, and then will there be a link <clears throat> on the PFAS webpage so that any of us or any of the public can go in to see the updated? Because this might be something we want to share with our constituencies. Yeah, I, I think we could do that, sure. I think that's something that, that, that we could include. Okay, that would be great. Um, does anyone have any questions for Mr. Wimsat? Yes, Ms. Allen. You're muted, Lorraine. Oh, I'm sorry, you're muted. There we go. <laughs> sorry about that. I didn't want you to hear my dog snoring. <laughs> um, one, two questions. One is about the poets. Um, do you have a requirement that looks at how often they're going to retest the water so they can look for medium, you know, swap out? Because there is a little bit of um, tension with public water remediation and private wells over you know, from a public's perspective, um, I know you're only regulating to state standards, but the public has this idea that we don't want to be exposed anymore to PFAS given the historical exposure. So there's that tension over, you know, where to swap out medium and what our exposure is gonna be. So what is the requirement for testing and ensuring that those poets are doing what a family would expect, you know? And I, it's my impression that a lot of the work understandably, I do understand why, is really a reducing exposure. And our goal really is to get to eliminating, be it the state doing that or people on their own being able to do that. So what what's the deal there? Right. Well, so the, the poet work plan, obviously, when, whenever you put a new poet in, there's an important you know process of kind of making sure it's working effectively, right? So there's immediate sampling to make sure that the poet installation is, is having the desired effect. And then there's operation maintenance over time. And we've had some discussions with them about that. And you know, they, they have quite a bit of experience with it because the company does, because they've been doing this for a similar contaminant suite in New York State and in Vermont. So they have uh, contracts there where they're providing this kind of service. And so they're, they're drawing off of that experience in terms of what they propose. We're gonna make sure that, you know, certainly in that first year that they're, you know, properly um, monitoring the effectiveness of these um, of these systems, and then they'll develop a frequency of maintenance based upon that. Um, I you know I think that as far as effectiveness of treatment, their their responsibility under the law is to ensure that they treat to meet the standard. That's 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 their responsibility under the law. Um, we we know from experience that um, these GAC systems for for treating the longer chain PFAS are quite effective and they usually result in um, uh, treatment to, to, uh, to, to non-detect for those longer chain compounds. Um, so that would be our expectation of how these systems will perform over time. Um, but, you know, we're going to learn more as, as they, obviously they're going to have several hundred of these systems in place and we're going to learn more as we uh, get data from those and, and, and we see what the monitoring shows. My other question is about um, discharging. You know, as you know, I'm sure EPA issued guidance earlier this week on the um, get the acronym right NPDES National what is it pollutant, pollutant discharge, pollutant discharge system, and I'm not really sure if that's one of those categories that New Hampshire defers to federal. Do we do our own permitting on that category, and if so, or if not, what are your thoughts on how we can incorporate that guidance? Uh, from the EPA, which is really trying to get at that source reduction, which we're all very interested in. Sure. Yeah. Well, so the, you're you're right. New Hampshire is one of just a few states that doesn't okay. actually implement the MPDES program at the state level. Having said that, we have a very active uh, wastewater engineering bureau that does work with our wastewater plants to make sure that they're in compliance. We have a pretreatment program who works with the industrial pretreatment coordinators in those towns to make sure that uh, when there's a problem, and, and we've actually done quite a bit of work, um, probably much more than most 
MPDES authorized states, uh, looking at um, the quality of the influent and effluent to our wastewater plants, the quality of the, of the sludge and biosolids that are generated from those. So we do work very closely and, and you know, we've been saying from the very beginning that in order to really attack and address this PFAS problem, we've got to get PFAS out of commerce in the places where it really isn't necessary. I mean, there are you know, a few really specialized applications where you know these products are really important for health and safety and that sort of thing. But you know, hamburger wrappers and things like that, do we, you know, do we really need to have PFAS in those? So um, so that's something that we're working on and and we think that you know we will we expect to see um, reduced concentrations of PFAS in the inlet wastewaters to our wastewater plants as a combination of number one people are getting away from using them in processes and in products but also we have worked pretty closely anthony druin who you, you may know his name has worked really closely with a lot of our plants who you know if they've identified a higher than expected influent concentration we've worked with them to help them identify where that might be coming from to try to eliminate those those inputs so there's a lot happening there so the fact that we don't have a an authorized NPDES program, I don't think diminishes our ability or our uh, efforts to look at those things. Thank you. I think you're really good at taking the guidance that comes from the EPA. I noticed that and really taking that seriously. So I appreciate that. Are there any other questions for Mr. Wimsat? Yes, Mr. Representative Dunn. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for. Uh, finding an alternate water source. I'm hearing really good things about the alternate, people that are on the alternate source of water. Oh, good, um, glad to yes. hear that. Um, Monadnock is still struggling. So I'm wondering if there's any way we can get them under 500, because it seemed like once they got over 500 homes, they really struggled. Like I'm on Monadnock and it's still about two, two and a half weeks to get delivery. Yeah. Is there any chance that the new source could uh, could take on more customers? Yes, I, I think that's something we're looking at. We're, we're trying to, you know, we, we want to make sure that we do it in a way that that doesn't have us backsliding. Um, but yeah, we're absolutely working on, and we've had discussions with Saint Cobain about advancing their sort of share of the market here, if you will. Um, so that, uh, and we we have found that um, what we've done already, I think, has has uh, taken some pressure off Manadnock, and it, it hasn't fully remedied things, but I think it's improved their service level as well. Oh, it absolutely has. We were up to like four to five weeks prior. So we're down to about two to two and a half weeks. So I appreciate your work on that. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Wimsat? Uh, yes, Mr. Preventure. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, just briefly, if uh, I got three points just to follow up on. And if you don't have answers, uh, Mr. Wimsat, maybe you can provide them at a, a subsequent meeting. Um, but the first one was um, back to the minutes of the um, the uh, October 14th meeting, I think, where um, the PFOA was identified in the stacks. Um, I didn't know if you had a chance to confer to know that if, if the DES suspects the PFOA is like a residue that remains in the stacks, or is it PFOA that's still being used currently, or if it's transformed. Um, just trying to get a, a, a sense of that, where it's coming from. Um, right. That was one the first question. Um, the second thing refers to a couple of um, prior letters that I think were being um, discussed um, regarding St. Cobain and enforcement on St. Cobain. One of them has to do with MBD Wells 4R and 5 in July 25th there was a letter um, from um, your office I believe you signed it where um, you were just requesting for St. Cobain to identify what sort of the long-range plan that they believe is in place to um, address the long-term operation and maintenance on those two wells and, and I wasn't aware that I saw a response since July 25th so I was just if you could provide a status update on that at some point. Um, and the last item was um, actually something that was submitted by Miss um, Mindy Mesmer regarding um, the, the apparent, what appears to be an underreporting of historical PFOA strength 
that was used at St. Cobain, the the uh, the purity of the PFOA was there was some other documents identified in a prior um, some kind of other litigation or something that that uh, suggested that the strength of the PFOA that was used by St. Cobain prior to 2004, I believe, was stronger than what was anticipated, and and if that impacted the modeling that was done to identify the groundwater management zone extent. Um, I'm not, I, I believe, from what I thought I remember, I thought the AG was asking for more information from St. Cobain on this or something, but I, I haven't heard more on that. And, I, you know, obviously I know you probably don't want to comment in detail on any, anything that the Attorney General might be involved with, but if there's any extent that you can provide an update on those um, three things, we would, I would appreciate it. Okay. And again, at some point in the future, if you don't have an answer on on those now, that's fine. Yeah, I, I've noted those, and I maybe what I'll do, I think probably would be best is for me to plan to do that at the at the next month's meeting. Sure. Thanks. I appreciate that. Okay. Um, are there any other questions for Mr. Wimsat? Yes, Mr. Bandazian. Thank you, uh, Mike. You may not have the information now, but um, do you? I'd be interested to know the time delay between the time of those recent bypass uh, operations and the time that DES receives a reporting of it. Um, just to be able to know, is it, is it timely, is it not timely, um, in case at some point there would be a reaction to a bypass operation. So you, you probably don't have that data with you, but I think it would be interesting to know going forward and um, separate from that, um, it, it occurred to me a few months ago, and I had a conversation with our planning director in, in our town on subdivisions. Um, we're still subdividing in Bedford, and I'm sure in all of our other towns, um, both in Bedford, in the GMZ, and outside of the GMZ. And so I asked our, it's not a normal uh, planning board checklist item, when you're determining if a, if a subdivision application is complete to look at a PFAS map. Um, but we have a very well populated state PFAS map now in our communities. And um, I just asked uh, our planning director to check and see if we are going to be creating a, a well radius within 500 feet of a well with, uh, that exceeds uh, the MCLs. And I don't think that there's any mechanism or can be any mechanism at the state level for ensuring that we're not creating uh, wells within 500 feet of uh, a contamination source. And probably a well location wouldn't be reported to the state until after it's drilled. Mm -hmm. So it may be that the best way to do it is through our individual community planning departments uh, to make sure that when we're creating wells <laughs> that we know uh, we're putting people, I'm saying Cobain's not most likely not going to test those new wells in the GMZ, I would imagine. Is that fair? Yeah, so well, so obviously we don't we don't we don't have an established gmz right now right we and and i think that you know early on for purposes of i think ease of reference that initial area where we we believe virtually most of the wells were going to be above set the, at the time the standard that was at 70 the immigrant groundwater quality standard we identified as a pre-gmz and i think that has created some confusion because it it really, there's no such thing, first of all, in the rules as a pre-GMC. It was just a term of art that, that was invented to try to describe this area that was encircled by a red line, right? And so the reality is we do not have a groundwater management zone established yet, and that's part of what we're working with St. Cobain to develop and that they're responsible to develop. Um, it's, it's difficult because this is, you know, this site is unlike any other. Normally we have a with a conventional release, it's a relatively small area, and we figure out where the groundwater is impacted, and that that you know through that the combination of property lines, we develop a, a GMZ that that 
you know, that, that encompasses the area that we believe groundwater is impacted. Obviously, this is, is a huge area and there's dispute over, you know, between the agency and between the company over, you know, areas where, you know, the, there's an impact and, and where there's the, and where they're responsible and, and, and as well. Um, we also have, you know, a consent decree, which, which creates a specific limitation. So um, we're still working on what that GMZ is going to look like, but, but you're absolutely right. There are going to be, we already know there are areas and wells outside of that consent decree area where we believe the impacts, ex where we know the impacts exist, and we, we in, in many cases, have attributed them to the emissions from the company based on the work that we've done. Um, but for the purposes of um, you know what you're asking about for development and installation of new wells, there really isn't in current law a way to, for the state to really effectively ensure that we're not we're not in a position to go out and and uh, um, put. Uh, uh, what's the word, uh, you know, uh, uh, notices in the deed of properties that we think are impacted um, here. So I think that there is a role for the towns to play, and that's probably something we should continue to talk with the towns about. At, and obviously, you all are on the ground. You've got a planning board. When there's a subdivision for development, you're, you're involved in that. And, and I think your question is a, is a really good question, is how, how can we ensure that folks that are constructing new homes and drilling wells for those homes are adequately noticed that there's a potential issue there. And then, you know, the question is, how do you, how do you regulate that, right? I mean, at the end of the day, um, if a subdivision gets approved and a well goes in, the well needs to be, if it's a, if it's community water system that's providing water for a number of homes, then they could be a regulated system and they have to provide clean, safe water. If it's a private home, um, you know, that there isn't necessarily a regulatory hook that requires that that water meet standards. But obviously for the individual homeowner, there's every incentive to make sure that the water is safe to drink. So it's a really, it, you're describing a really difficult uh, situation that isn't really particularly well addressed by our current uh, regulatory structure. Okay. Um, let's Pretty much what I thought, and, and probably not anything, unless we require PFAS testing of newly drilled wells, it's probably not something that would ever get caught. Other than at the town level, maybe. Um, Mr. Mendezian, I do want to bring your attention to a, an LSR, a legislative service request that's been filed by representatives in Portsmouth. And uh, Representative Murphy and I are co-sponsors of that, but it will bring state regulation into that and put the impetus on the well driller to test not just for PFAS, but for several other um, uh, components that might be in well water that new owners would need to become aware of. Um, arsenic, lead um, is a variety of things. Some of those are already in statute, but um, PFAS would be added to it. There's been a lot of renditions of this LSR that's been going around. I, I really haven't seen the final version, but I think we're getting close. So um, I'll make sure to keep you abreast of, of that, especially when it, it completes the LSR process and goes into bill. Great, thank okay. you. Are there any other uh, questions of Mr. Wimsat? I do have one. Oh yeah, um, who is that? Hi, Mr. sorry, this is, this is Michael Strand, the uh, oh, Citizen yes, Commissioner Michael. from Dufferin. Okay. I wonder if you if you were on the line I'll add you to the attendance yeah go yes. ahead um, and and just to quickly um, sort of piggyback on uh, mr. Bandazian's observation I think um, you know that approaching it potentially from a planning you know board or town level could be a really uh, you know smart path given the failure of uh, you know House bill 1454 that would have required a setback on new landfills um, and you know if it's unlikely that you know, future potential, you know, legislation could address, um, you know, the the polluter source at least. You know, potentially there could be a path to, you know, to keep people safe. You know, regulating through a, you know, the the planning town side of it. Um, my question for Mr. Wimsot is, um, and just looking at in the Bedford, you know, poet numbers, um, and you know, considering, 
you know, likely future EPA guidance or, you know, actual, you know, federally legislated, you know, changes to, you know, to MCLs that the state would then be, you know, required to honor. Um, is there a contingency plan for current wells that are below MCL, um, but would likely be above, you know, future pending MCLs? Um, you know, and, you know, is there, is there a plan in process or is there a contingency to address these wells that are not viewed as, you know, contaminated or over MCL now, but will be, particularly in a place like Bedford, where you'd be looking at a pretty high volume of additional, you know, contamination likely connected to Gobain, you know, once the studies come out to isolate and identify, um, you know, town responsible areas. Sure. Thanks, Michael. And, and nice to meet you. I know we talked on the phone and nice to see you here or at least hear you um so that's a great question uh break that down a little bit so we do anticipate um and up until just a few weeks ago we anticipated that before the end of this month we would see a proposed new drinking water mcl for um several pfas compounds proposed by epa um, they have since indicated that that's going to be delayed so it's going to happen sometime in I, I don't know for sure, I, I, I'm assuming, but I might be wrong, the first quarter of 2023. Um, under our state regulatory framework, um, generally if, if, uh, if EPA, now this would be proposed, so there may be some delay, it could be up to a year before it would go final, but basically an MCL adopted by the federal government, a, a federal drinking water MCL under the Federal Safe Drinking Water Act, we would adopt that standard as well as a state MCL. And so that's what I would expect would likely happen. Um, and we understand that that MCL may well be lower. Let's talk about PFOA because that's the primary contaminant in, in this area. And it's always easier to talk about the specific thing than talk about in the abstract. So for PFOA, we anticipate, you know, we currently regulate PFOA with the state drinking water MCL at 12 parts per trillion. And if EPA proposes uh, one that's lower than that, we would anticipate that we would adopt that. And that would mean that additional wells, both inside the consent decree area and outside, um, we, we know based because we already have the data, would, 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 would be, you know, if you, if you pick a number, there's gonna be some number that are currently below 12, but above some other number that might be set. And so with respect to inside the consent decree area, if we set a state MCL, a neighboring groundwater quality standard, at that level, um, then the company would be responsible to address any impacted wells above that standard. So um, they would, inside the consent decree area, it would, lowering the, the state MCL would, and AGQS would simply increase the number of, of properties where St. Cobain had a legal responsibility under our agreement under state law to provide alternate water. Um, for the areas outside the consent decree, um, as you may know, one of the things that the state has done to try to address and assist people who, uh, whose properties have wells that are above the standard is to provide a PFAS rebate program. And that rebate program basically works like this. If you are impacted above standard and you've not been offered alternate water by any other party, then you're eligible to apply um, to the state for a rebate of up to $5,000 to defray the cost of installing um, a point of entry treatment system on your well. If you're fortunate enough to be close by to a public water system, then you, and you choose to, to connect to that water system in lieu of putting a poet system in, you're eligible for a rebate of up to $10,000 to defray the costs of, of that connection. Um, so if we, and, and that basically is tied to what the standard is. So if the MCL and the AGQS go to a lower number, then all the parties who are then above that lower number would be eligible to participate in this rebate program. So right now, those are the primary, uh, I think, uh, pieces of, uh, you know, or, or potential solutions that are in play for, for that eventuality of when that, when that, if that standard gets lowered. I hope that was responsive to your question. Yeah, no, that was great, Mike. I appreciate that. Um, two quick follow-ups, if, if possible. Um, and I know there may not be, you know, an answer here, but I think that's part of, you know, the, the value of asking. Um, for, you know, contaminated wells, you know, outside of the consent decree, you know, and, and these could be, uh, you know, current, you know, that, uh, you know, are eligible for the rebate program or future, you know, pending changes to MCL. Um, but for those wells where there is a strong likelihood that 
you know, St. Cobain, you know, was the, the cause, you know, and, and, you know, air deposits were the cause, you know, based on, you know, engineering and consulting reports, you know, that isolate town responsible areas, um, you know, would drastic changes to that MCO or higher volume of, you know, contaminated wells with PFOA, um, you know, would that trigger any reevaluation of consent decree responsibility or is the consent decree binding regardless of changes to you know, the regulatory environment? Yeah, I, I think I understand your question. I, I guess the, I, I would answer by saying, um, you know, I think that obviously new information is always of interest to us and we want to evaluate where we're at based on new information. I'm going to, I'm going to be reluctant to comment on what that means in the consent agreement. No, I understand. Um, and second follow-up would simply be, um, you know, and, and again, I apologize, this may again be, you know, a bit rhetorical, but, you know, I think does need to be on record based on the feedback I'm, I'm receiving from affected residents. Um, you know, is there a concern, you know, for areas, uh, you know, they're outside the consent decree, you know, with likely COVID responsibility, they're eligible for the rebate program, um, you know, or in the future, potentially, you know, as we look at federal, you know, funding for, you know, water infrastructure expansion. Um, is there a concern from DES that whether via state rebate program, you know, which I believe is a cost share with some federal dollars or future, you know, federal dollars for infrastructure, you know, uh, you know water expansion, that these are still, you know, taxpayer dollars. Uh, so, you know, in essence, you know, a concern that I've heard and, you know, also identified myself is, you know, that we essentially are, uh, you know, we have, taxpayer subsidization of a corporate polluter. And you know, I don't say that to sound harsh, but you know, I think that needs to be said. And I'm just curious whether internally in DES that's a conversation or a concern that's happening. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure it's helpful for me to comment on that. I, I do want to make sure that you know, the rebate program does not consist of any federal dollars. That that rebate program is state funds. It's still taxpayer okay. dollars, but it's not federal money, just just to be clear. Under, understood. Um, and and yeah, I mean we what we really want to do mission one is to make sure that people aren't getting exposed to the contaminant. So our primary goal with the rebate program was recognizing that there was not going to be another party coming in to provide assistance to these folks. We wanted we went after initially drinking water groundwater trust fund monies. Um, to uh, to address that, and and then uh, when we realized that the program probably needed to be a little bigger than what we got from the trust fund commission, uh, we also um, uh, sought in the last session of the legislature a 25 million dollar um, uh, appropriation from 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 surplus general funds to address to apply to our PFAS rebate and grant program, and a significant portion of those funds have been allocated to the rebate program to make sure that we have adequate funds to uh, meet what we think will be the demand for those rebates. I understand. Thank you. Um, last quick question, and, um, and we may be I may be jumping ahead if there's a, a section on the agenda for. Um, you know, additional discussion of LSRs or legislative recommendations and updates. But um, question for you hypothetically uh, would be if legislation at the state level were ever to be presented and pass that would define, uh, you know, permanent solution, um, you know, for, you know, contaminated, you know, St. Cobain attributed, um, you know, wells, uh, you know, remediation um, as expansion of, you know, existing municipal water infrastructure, would DES be obligated to enforce that or would the consent decree and existing agreements, um, you know, would they override any new legislation defining permanent solution? Yeah, that's a legal question that I'm, I'm not prepared to answer. I understand. I appreciate you fielding it nonetheless. Are you all set, Mr. Strand? I am all set. Thank you very much, okay. guys. All right. Are there any other questions for Mr. Wimsat? Um, I have I have one. Um, Mr. Wimsat, um, when you gave the update of the uh, residents that um, St. Cobain's addressing that were previously being challenged, have all those challenged residences been resolved now? 
remember there was, I, I forget how many, uh, some of them were in, I think, South Merrimack, where there was a contentious issue whether the contamination was from TCI or St. Cobain um, or another source. Um, but have, have, the, have those all been resolved? Um, I, I'm not sure which ones you're talking about. I, I will tell you that the, 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 the remaining properties that, that, that uh, St. Cobain has said that they believe that there's another source there and they're not prepared, th those still remain in play. We still haven't reconciled all of that. Okay, that, yeah, that was my question. All right, do we anticipate when they will be resolved? Because those are homes that I believe are in the consent decree area, correct? Right. So, so right. The, 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 there are a few areas where basically Saint Cobain has drawn buffer zones where they believe that there may be another potential source that should be explored before they provide uh, agree to provide alternate water remedies. And we're, those are still. I, and I, I know, unfortunately, I don't. I don't have a. A, a time at this point to tell you, you know, how fast I think that'll be reconciled. I don't know the answer to that. Well, <clears throat> I, I would like to ask DES to try to expedite that because those homes have now gone on. We're we're approaching seven years, and 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 there's no resolution for them. And I think they're due to have one. Um, I, I think we we need to really push. Um, push an answer for those for those people and get them some relief. Um, and if if DS is prepared at the next meeting to present a deadline of when they um, will expect St. Cobain to have resolution to that, I would appreciate that. I think we owe it to people. And um, and and also, who is making that decision? I mean, is it just up to St. Cobain to say, hey, it's not it's not our fault. We're not going to cover it. And what's the process for getting to a decision for those homes? Yeah, that, that that's part of ongoing negotiations. The, the 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 agency's position is essentially that any property inside the consent decree, unless it's been specifically identified that the contamination is solely due to another source, um, that St. Cobain has a responsibility to a responsibility to provide alternate water in that area. If we believe, whenever we believe that contaminated well is impacted by St. Cobain's emissions, there's a responsibility as we see it under the consent agreement to provide um, alternate water for that for that home. That That's a sticking point in the negotiations and, and the work we've done with them. So um, I, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be able to comment on what we're going to do to reconcile that or how fast that's going to happen. That's a, that's a that's an enforcement question that's just not appropriate for me to be opining on in this setting. Okay, um, but it's it's important to us. It's important to the people. So if there's anything that you can do, even though I know you can't comment on it, um, I'm going to keep asking it every month, and I'm going to be making an issue of it. Um, okay, um, I guess there are some other issues. I'm going to wait till other. Um, but let's let's move along. We've we've been it's almost an hour into this. Um, Dr. Bush, are you still on the line? I am. I'm here. Oh, great. Would you like to provide an update for DHHS? I can. Yeah. Thanks so much. So I can let everyone know that at DHHS we continue to work on an MOA that many were interested in, and I believe there may be related LSRs uh, between DES and DHHS focused on data sharing. So we've been working with our legal teams and do have a draft of that MOA um, prepared. We had one previously and like everything, it expired in June. So everything has kind of a timeline and we just are working to update that. So that is in process and we can keep you updated on that. We also, um, hopefully people are excited to hear and uh, on ongoing updates that we are continuing to work with partners at Dartmouth College and also our partners at DES on what will be a New Hampshire specific PFAS fact sheet targeting healthcare providers. I know it's something that has been talked about for a long time. And so we, we also have a draft of that document and um, plan to share that with some key informants or key stakeholders in the healthcare provider sector and get feedback on that. 
in addition, we are supporting additional education and outreach to the healthcare provider sector. So we continue to work with Nancy Murphy here and also Peg DiTulio from the Nurse Practitioner Association to support outreach efforts, um, primarily at the Nurse Practitioner Conference that happens every, um, every spring, summer, early summer, but also starting to think about what other venues might be a good place to share this information, things potentially like Dartmouth Grand Rounds or other medical association meetings. So th those are ongoing co conversations. Just as a reminder, we do have an interagency environmental health integration team that brings programs from both agencies together. And there's sort of a subset of that group focused on communications, and then a subset of that subset focused on um, outreach, clinical outreach and education. And so that's that's the forum where many of these conversations are happening and starting to think about how to bring some of this information out to key partners. Um, I also wanted to let you know that in addition to sort of state and local partners, we continue to stay in open communication with our federal partners. And as Mike Winsett mentioned, sort of keeping an eye and, and keeping open lines of communication with both CDC, ATSDR, and EPA around the evolving interim health advisories. And also sort of the recommendations that came out of that NASM report, the National Academy of Sciences report, um, with clinical guidance for ATSDR. And so we're waiting and continue to be in touch with ATSDR on what updates they may be making to their clinical guidance as well, which would then hopefully dovetail with our New Hampshire specific information. So in addition to that, I think outside of the education and outreach pieces, um, from a health outcome perspective, we do have the finalized cancer report, and we have been in touch with the chair, Representative Rung, and plan to be back in January to share that report. And um, if there are questions about that report, it may be best to hold them until January, um, when Whitney Hammond and others from the agency and the chronic disease section will be there. Um, but I'm also happy to, to take any questions today, and, and we are meeting internally next week um, to finalize, you know, the presentation and what will be shared at that January meeting. So happy to bring any questions to to the agency for that internal meeting next week. And uh, on a related note, um, while outside of um, Southern New Hampshire, I did want to let everyone know that DHHS continues to work with ATSDR. 